Metro 2035, Dmitry Glukovsky, Chapter 23, His Own People. There they are, over that way. Down below, through the bars of the banisters, he fancied he saw, no, he did see them, black boots. Run! Open the doors, open them, I tell you. Have you totally flipped? You haven't got a suit. I'm just fine. Do it. We'll croak here because of you, you cretin. Come on! Where is he? Where are they? Give me your hand. Don't let go. I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't want to stay here. Screw you! Where could you go up there? What is there for you on the surface? Overturning tables, jumping over benches, knocking down cackling Brahmins, they dashed to the far end of the station. Soldiers of the order came pouring out of the passage and scattered across the platform like lead shot. They reached the hermetic doors at top speed, stuck a gun barrel in the sentry's face, spun the locking screws, and dragged the ton of steel along the rails. It started shifting reluctantly. They squeezed through a crack and flew up the steps. How could Art Yom still have any strength left, or any life? The pursuers came after them, clattering over the granite, hot on their heels, firing as they ran, but missing because they were running. The clamor of a shattered chicken coop. One door froze. Only a narrow crack was left through to backstage. The soldiers in black squeezed through it, but the Brahmins cowered back, keeping well away to avoid picking up someone else's dose of radiation. They darted out into the vestibule, Artyom, Anya, Timur, and Ilya. In the second they had gained, they managed to break open the outer door and tumble out naked into the freezing Moscow night. So what's here? Here. They left it here. Wait. There it is. Your hand. That way. Hunched over at a run along the silent library where Artyom once left behind his fear, under its blind windows, under the elephantine pedestals of its columns, over marble slabs that had come away from the walls. Behind them, black figures shot out in pursuit from the Borovitskaya station vestibule that looked like the entrance to a mausoleum. They hesitated, wondering about running down the street with no protection. We'll get hammered here. Do you know what the background level is like here? There it is. Here. Is that it? Yes. Savelli's towed Japanese auto, abandoned after Letyaga had brought them away them from the jammers. When? It was ages ago. Savelli was gone. The people had swept him away and trampled him at Komsomol Station. On the very first day of his service in the order, he had been killed, gone missing in action. But his car was right here, standing and waiting for its owner. Artyom swung the handle and climbed in through the car's forgotten hatch. Under the little mat on the passenger side, there was a spare key. Savali had told him about it at Komsomolskaya, as if it was a bequest. Artyom put in the key and turned it. The car came alive. The black figures broke away from Borovitskaya after all and took the plunge. Get inside! Where are you going? To exhibition. To my people. Home. To tell them. Not me. I'll stay here. What would I do there? I'll come to terms with them. Get into the car, you idiot. There are guys. I'll come to terms. Wait, I forgot. There. Is this yours? They gave it to me. He took it out. Grayish black. Dull. The Nagant. It's mine. Timur stuck it in through Artyom's open window. Thanks a fucking heap. That's it. Go. Timur raised his hands, swung round, and set off towards the black devils running in his direction. In his mind... Artyom made the sign of the cross over him and stepped on the gas. From Okotny Ryad, from Tverskaya Street, the wind brought a brief spurt of sound, the growl of a motor. They shot off, swung round with a squeal of smoking rubber. Anya on his left, on the front passenger seat, Ilya Stepanovich, their redundant tail dangling free behind them. They battened the windows tight. In the rearview mirror, Timurchik tumbled mutely to the ground like a rag doll falling forward with his arms raised. And then, a second later, the armored off-roader darted into the same black frame. It braked by the body, doused its lights, dwindled, and dissolved. They hurtled along Vozdvizhenka Street, through all the places where Artyom had strolled a hundred times. But now, this was the last time. Someone's pecked out skulls, gnawed out buildings, and dried out trees gazed emptily after the speeding Japanese car from the side of the road and the empty sky was highlighted slightly by a gnawed-away moon. There were lots and lots of stars pinned to the sky, 
like on that night when Art Yom went out on the surface with Zhenya after tricking him and Vitalik into opening the hermetic door to the botanical gardens. Remember, Zhen? Stop it, Art Yom, please. Sorry, I won't do it again, honestly. The bone-white limestone of the Ministry of Defense blinked and disappeared. The little crypt of Arbat Station whisked by. On the right, tall buildings with twenty-something stories stood straight and narrow, looking like soldiers forgotten at a victorious parade. The fatuous and bombastic buildings of Kalininsky Avenue passed by on the left, with the very biggest advertising screens in somewhere called Europe, now burnt out and black. The sentries saluted Artyom. The screens showed him his past and his future. How does the air feel? Different! He remembered the first time he had been here two years ago. How different everything here was then. There was life here then, a twisted, weird, alien life, but it was teeming, and now... Artyom looked in the mirror. He thought he saw a little patch of darkness pursuing them somewhere in the distance. Did he only think it? He turned sharply, with a squeal, onto the Garden Ring Road and set off along it in a gnawed-out rut, past the Embassy of the United States, burnt on a pyre, past the high-rise on the Krasnopresnenskaya embankment, built for the living dead with a pointed stake on its roof, past the huge, substantial granite buildings that were called Stalinkas, in honor of the dummy, past the bomb crater squares, past the trenches of the side streets. He looked and thought, the dead for the dead. Home? Anya asked. Home, Artyom replied. The right-handed Japanese bullet darted out onto Peace Prospect, violating the road markings and hurtled off to the east. They slid by under a flyover, the intersection with the Third Ring Road, which brought them out onto a bridge over a railway laid somewhere right on the very bottom of the darkness. A bit farther on, and a rocket rose up above the trees, frozen in the sky, the Museum of Stupid Space Exploration, a signal that the exhibition of economic achievements was close. Again, Artyom fancied there was some movement behind them. He even looked back for a second, and almost crashed into a crooked, battered truck, only just swerving away in time. He darted between the rusty tins, picking his way along a familiar track to the entrance pavilion, to his home station. He drove the car in behind a currency exchange kiosk, a metal cube, and hit it. We got here quickly. Maybe the dose won't be too big, Artyom told Anya. Okay, she replied. They climbed out and listened. There was a roaring somewhere in the distance. Run. They made their way into the vestibule. Artyom cast a final glance through the dust on the plexiglass. Were they following? Had they caught up? He didn't think so. If they were still chasing, they'd fallen behind. The upper hermetic door was open. They had to go down the escalator, fifty meters down into the depths. Down below, it was pitch dark, but in a year, Artyom had learned these steps off by heart. Ilya stumbled and would have gone flying nose first onto the steps and farther on. To break his back, they barely caught him in time. Eventually, the steps ended. At the other side of a short platform, there was a steel wall, the hermetic door. Artyom stepped with blind precision to the left, feeling as he moved for a telephone receiver on a flexible metal tube on the wall, the first out of two. Open up! It's me, Artyom! The receiver was as deaf as if the wire had been snapped, as if he was calling into one of those buildings on the outside, not into his own living station. Do you hear me? This is Artyom. Dark! The echo of his voice jangled in the coal dust in the fine metal plates. There wasn't any other sound in the receiver. Artyom felt for Anya's fingers. He squeezed them. Everything's fine. He's just sleeping. Yes. When you left, was everything... Everything was fine, Artyom. Ilya Stepanovich was breathing laboriously and loudly. Don't breathe so deeply, Artyom advised him. The background radiation, you know. He hung up the phone, picked it up again, and pressed his mouth to the cold plastic circle. Hello, this is Artyom. Open up. No one had any intention of opening up for them, as if there was no one to do it. He walked up to the wall and hammered on the metal with his fist. That wasn't any good. Inaudible. Then he remembered about the revolver. He grabbed hold of the barrel in order to slam the handle against the steel. 
then thought better of it. What if it was loaded? He pulled out the cylinder. For some reason, there were two cartridges inserted in it. He squeezed them out and put them in his pocket. Then he started beating that nagant against the iron curtain as if it was a bell. Boom. 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 Get up, people. Wake up. Come alive. Well? He pressed one ear against the wall. Was anyone there? Again. Boom. 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 Artyom. There must be people there. He grabbed the phone again, hung it on the cradle, and took it off again. Hello. Hello. This is Artyom. Sukhoi. Open up. Something began stirring unwillingly inside there. Do you hear me? They coughed. Open the doors. Finally, they spoke. What the fuck is all this? It's night. Nikitska? Open up, Nikitska. It's Art Yom. Open up. Open up, Nikitska, and guzzle the rads, right? What the fuck did you want out there again? Open up. We haven't got any protection out here. That'll teach you a fucking lesson then. Right then, I'll tell my stepfather. You shit. Someone blew his nose inside. All right. The metal wall crept upwards lazily and indifferently. Light appeared. They walked into the buffer section. A tap in the wall. A hose pipe lying there. Another phone. Open the buffer! Rinse yourself off first, dragging all sorts of crap in here. How? We're not dressed out here. Get washed, I tell you. He had to lash himself and Ilya Stepanovich and Anya with cold, chlorinated water. They walked into the station soaking wet and frozen. Instantly, they caught a smell of manure and pigs. Everyone's asleep. Sukhoi's asleep. That's some outfit you've got. But where can we go? Your tent's free. Nikitska looked at these shivering little puppy dogs and relented. We were expecting you. Wait, I'll get you some cloths to wipe yourselves off and go and lie down. You can sort things out tomorrow morning. Art Yom wanted to argue, but Anya took him by the hand and pulled him away. That's right, he thought. I came barging in from the street in the middle of the night without a suit. I don't want to wake up the whole station as well. They'll definitely think I'm a half-wit. Never mind, there's no great hurry. Before the buzz creeps here from Polis. Just tell the sentries not to let any strangers into the station. And from up on top... He remembered about the patch of darkness. Don't let anyone else in from up on top, all right? Trust me, Nikitska grinned. I won't go waking up again for that sort of thing. That's all, then. Oh, yeah, and this comrade here has to be given a place somewhere, said Artyom, remembering Ilya Stepanovich. I'll explain everything to my stepfather in the morning. Ilya Stepanovich stayed with Nikitska, looking like an abandoned dog. But that wasn't Artyom's misfortune. He hadn't taken this man as a hanger-on, and he hadn't abandoned him. Their tent really was free. Hadn't anyone dared to hanker after it? No doubt people had attempted to take it, but Sukhoi had held them off. Being even the boss's stepson was pretty useful. They switched on the torch and stood it so that it shone into the floor, in order not to wake the neighbors. They got changed into the dry clothes that were there, without looking at each other naked. It felt shameful and awkward. They sat down cross-legged on the mattress. Is there anything left to drink? Art Yom asked in a whisper. You had some? Yes, I bought some. Anya whispered back. Will you give me a swig? They drank by turns, gulping from the chipped neck of the bottle. The hooch was lousy with a vile odor and dregs on the bottom, but it did the trick. It unscrewed the head that had been twisted into his shoulders and relaxed the cramp that had already become habitual in his back, his arms, and his soul. I realize that I can't live without you. Come here. Really, I tried. Art Yom took a big swallow. It wouldn't go down. It scorched his larynx and he started coughing. After we talked, at Polis, your daddy sent me to Komsomol Station to give the Reds a present of cartridges so that the rebellion, the starving people there, they rebelled. And I ended up there by chance with the Reds. All of us. I don't know how many thousands of people. And they fired at them with machine guns. A woman there gave me... She asked me to hold her son, about five or six years old. I held him in my arms. She was killed. And I thought then that you and I would have to adopt that boy. And a minute later, he was killed as well. Anya took the bottle from him. Her eyes were glittering. You've got cold hands. You've got cold lips. They drank in silence by turns. Are we going to live here now? I have to tell all of them. Sukhoi, everyone. Our people. 
Tomorrow, calmly, first before other people tell them everything their own way. Do you think they'll believe you? They won't go anywhere, Art Yom. We'll see. I'm sorry. No, no need to be. It's me. I... You even have a cold tongue. My heart's hot, though, and you're covered in goosebumps. Let me have your heart over here. I want to get warm. They woke late, and at the same time. At last he got dressed in his normal clothes, a sweater and threadbare jeans, instead of that repulsive waiter's outfit. He stuck his feet in a pair of galoshes, waited for Anya to get dressed. They crawled out of the tent, smiling. Their female neighbors looked at them in envious condemnation. The men offered Artyom a smoke. He thanked them and took one. But where's Sukhoi? He asked Furcoat Dashka, who happened to be close by. He's preparing a surprise for you. You've gone bald, have you? What did we tell you? Where? In the piggery. They went to his stepfather together. The enclosure was in a dead-end tunnel. They walked to the end of the station, greeting everyone. They all looked at him as if he was a ghost, and at Anya as if she was a hero. He's over there, your man, sticking a pig! Igul gestured towards the far end of the enclosure. He couldn't catch his breath. They walked past wet pink snouts poking out through the wattle fence. Youngsters jostling at the troughs, boars roaring, immense sows with colorless eyelashes, each with a row of about ten tiny, squealing piglets. Sukhoi, in rubber wading boots, was walking among the yearling boars. The piggery foreman, Pyotr Illich, was standing beside him, explaining. Don't take this one, Alex and Lexike. That one was ill. He'll be bitter. That one over there, the frisky one, that's what I advise, Proshka. Come here, Proshka. You should have told me sooner, Alexander Alexei. It's best not to feed them for a day in advance. Well, it came as a surprise to me, too, said Sukhoi, not seeing Artyom. My son came back. I was afraid it was all over. There hadn't been a single word. But he's alive. And with his wife. It seems like they've made up. Such a joy. All right, let me have your Proshka. Prosha, Proshenka, come here. Now how am I going to lure him out of there, the pest? He needed to be left hungry for a while. Then he'd come out himself for feed. But now... Nah, don't drag him. A pig doesn't like to be forced. Let me. There is a way. Artyom stopped short before he reached them. He looked at Sukhoi. His eyes were stinging. From the stink? Sukhoi stepped back and made way for the specialist. The foreman took an empty bucket off a hook and put it over Proshka's head. The pig froze. Rooted to the ground at first, grunted inquiringly, and then started backing away. Then Pyotr Illich took hold of his tail and started guiding him backwards towards the exit from the pen. Hold the others. That's the important thing. But none of them are butting in. Looking into the bucket, Proshka became obedient. Guiding him with his tail, they led him out of the pen in a jiffy. Then they took the bucket off. Pyotr Illich scratched the pig behind the ears and then deftly thrust a loop of rope into the mouth that was half open in pleasure, shoving it as far past the fangs as possible and drawing it tight above the long snout. He tied the rope to a little column supporting the wall of the enclosure. Artyom didn't watch this. He had seen it a hundred times and done it himself. He looked at Sukhoi. Eventually, Sukhoi looked round. Oh, you've woken up! He walked over and they embraced. Anechka, welcome back. How are you, Uncle Sasha? We're getting by, taking it easy. Sukhoi smiled. I missed you. Howdy, traveler. Pyotr Illich held out his left hand. In the right hand, he already had the long knife for the slaughter, looking more like a honed spike. Right, Alex and Lexik, hold him for a minute. I wanted to astonish you with fresh meat, Sukhoi said with a smile. You spoiled my surprise. Proshka stretched out the rope as far as he could. But the rope was short. His hind legs shifted as far away from the column as they could manage, but his snout, captured by the rope, couldn't move even slightly away from it. But Proshka didn't screech. He wasn't anticipating death. And then Sukhoi stroked him too, and the young boar became calm and thoughtful. Pyotr Illich squatted down beside Proshka and scratched him on the side, feeling for the pulse with his fingers. Through the skin and the ribs, he found the heart. With his left hand, he set the knife at the required spot, without even scratching the skin yet. The other pigs gathered round, curiously thrusting their snouts closer in order to figure out what was going on. Okay, bye now. He swung his right hand hard onto the handle, knocked it in like a nail. The knife slipped in immediately right up to the handle. 
Kroshka jerked, but remained standing. He still hadn't had any time to understand anything at all. Pyotr Illich pulled the blade out of the wound and plugged the little hole neatly with a little rag. That's it! Move back! Proshka carried on standing there, and then he staggered. His hind legs buckled and he sat on his backside, but immediately got up again, and fell again. He started squealing, realizing he had been betrayed. He tried to get up, but couldn't manage it any longer. Some of the pigs looked at him indifferently with their little buttons. Some carried on guzzling from the trough. Somehow, Proshka's alarm wasn't transmitted to any of them. He tumbled over onto his side and started jerking his legs about. He squealed for a while, past blackish-brown round balls of dung, and went quiet. All this didn't concern the others. They didn't even seem to have noticed the death that had occurred so close. All done, said Pyotr Ilyich. I'll butcher him and deliver him to the kitchen. What do you say? Roast him, braise a hawk? Roast him or braise him, Tayoma? Sukhoi asked, since the surprise didn't work out anyway. Better roast him, Sukhoi nodded. How are you? How am I? I don't even know where to begin. Let's go. No point standing here. Where did you get to? Where? Artyom looked round at Anya. I was in Polis. Did anyone come here from Polis, from Miller, or any strangers in general? Did anyone ask for me? No, it was all quiet. Why should they have? Did our people come back at night from the center? From Hansa? Didn't they bring any rumors? Sukhoi gave him an intent look. What happened? Something's happened, right? They walked out of the piggery into the station. The red emergency lighting made it look as if Alexander Alexievich had slit the pig's throat. Or Artyom had. Let's go and have a smoke. Artyom's stepfather didn't approve of smoking, but this time he didn't grumble. He took a handmade roll-up out of a cigarette case and held it out. Anya helped herself, too. They walked well away from the living area and lit up sweetly. I found survivors, Artyom said simply. Other survivors. You? Where? Sukhoi squinted at Anya. Artyom parted his lips to carry on and suddenly started thinking. An independent station. The exhibition. And Sukhoi was its boss. But were there any independent stations here? He's telling the truth, Anya confirmed. Didn't you know? Me? I didn't. Sukhoi answered carefully in order not to offend Artyom, who had become even thinner and had a shaved head now. Middle level, Artyom stated to himself. All right. What? Uncle Sash, the whole thing's a long story. Let me just give you the essence. We're not the only ones who survived. The whole world did. Various cities in Russia. The West. And that's true too, said Anya. The West? And what about the war? Sukhoi frowned. Is it still going on then? And why are the airwaves empty? Why hasn't anyone here seen these survivors? They jam the radio like in Soviet times, Artyom tried to explain. Because the war is allegedly still going on. Sukhoi understood that. That's familiar. Artyom narrowed his eyes dubiously. Familiar? We've been through that before. Who is it? The Reds? Do you know Besselov? Artyom asked. Besselov? Sukhoi echoed. The one from Hansa? There isn't any Hansa, Uncle Sash, and there isn't any red line, and soon they won't exist at all. Soon they'll combine everything together to stand against the common enemy, so they never climb up out of the metro. That's the new scenario now. Sukhoi seemed to believe it, but he checked with Anya just to make sure. Does anyone else know this? That people survived in other cities? They made a public announcement about it yesterday at Polis, she replied. It's true, Alexander Alexeyevich. The whole world survived, and how do they live? Better than us. I don't know. They don't say, Artyom explained. But if it was worse, they'd be sure to say so. Su Koi lit a second roll-up straight from the first one that had burnt through too fast. Bastard fucking hell! He looked at the red lamp for a while. Do you owe this Besselov anything? Artyom asked. No, what could I? I've only ever seen him once in Hansa. That's good. Uncle Sash, you have to close off the station. Close it, so that no one from there gets through to us. And get the people ready. You have to tell them everything. They'll believe you. Get them ready for what? They have to be let out of here, let out of the metro, while it's still possible. At least our people. Let out to where? Up on top. Where to, exactly? There are two hundred people in the station. There are women and children. Where do you want to lead them to? We'll send out scouts. Find a place where the background radiation is low. Some people came from Murom. They just live up on the surface there. 
Sukhoi started his third roll-up in a row. What for? How do you mean, what for? What would we go to Marom for? Why would all these people leave the metro and go off somewhere else? They live here, Artyom. This is their home, here. They won't follow you. Because they were born up on the surface, in the fresh air, under the open sky, in freedom. Alexander Alexeevich nodded to Artyom, not mockingly, but sympathetically, precisely like a children's doctor. They don't remember that any longer, Tiomochka. They've got used to being here. They're like Morlocks here, like moles. Ah, but at least life follows a well-worn path. Everything's clear. They won't want to change anything. But the moment they sit down by a campfire, all they ever do is remember who had what, the way each of them used to live. You can't take them back to the things they miss. And they don't want to go back, just to remember. You're still young. Someday you'll understand. I don't understand. Well, I'm simply asking you to close off the station. If you don't want to tell them, let me do it. Otherwise, that plague will ooze its way in here. They'll fill people's head full of shit like everywhere else. I've already seen it happen. I can't close off the station, Art Yom. We trade with Hansa. We get the all mash, you know, the combo fodder, for our pigs from them. And we have to sell off the manure to Riga Station. What all mash? There are mushrooms. The mushrooms are screwed. Almost the entire harvest died off. You see? Artyom gave Anya a crooked smile. And you were concerned about the mushrooms. It turns out we can get by without them, but we can't manage without their shitty all mash. Don't judge me. I'm the station master, Artyom. Sukhoi shook his head. I've got two hundred souls looking to me for everything. I have to feed them. Well, at least let me tell them. They'll find out anyway. Do you think it's worth it? Sukhoi sighed. Coming from you? Yes, it is. They agreed. The people would be gathered together after supper when the shifts on the farms ended. Until then, Artyom had to keep quiet. And he did keep quiet, trying on for size his old life at exhibition. The bicycles, watch duty in the tunnel, the tent. This life had shrunk, and he couldn't fit into it anymore. Disoriented, Ilya Stepanovich trailed around after him. Artyom had agreed with Sukhoi for Ilya Stepanovich to be allowed to stay at the station. So Artyom was showing him what was what and how things were arranged here. Although the teacher was shabby and wretched, fur coat Dashka took an instant liking to him. They filled him up with weak tea. The mushrooms were running out. People asked about his life. He replied evasively, and Artyom didn't give him away. But Ilya Stepanovich was a good listener. As Artyom told him about the station, he put in bits about himself now and then. It just came out that way. As they wandered between the tents, things came to him. This is where Jenka used to live. My childhood friend. We opened the doors at the botanical gardens together. He died later. Someone in the watch cracked up when the Dark Ones were advancing on exhibition and killed him. And this was the spot where I saw Hunter for the first time and was totally bowled over by him. Look, we walked round the empty hall at night. And he took my fate in his massive great hands and tied it in a knot in a moment, like a metal bar, well, and so on, about the dark ones. It was ridiculous to keep quiet about them at this stage, the tragedy of his entire life, and it had turned out to be a damp squib. Ilya Stepanovich nodded rapidly, as if all this concerned him, but who could tell what he was thinking about? Artyom held out like that until the evening. Of course, a royal supper like that wasn't restricted just to close friends. All comers were invited. The tables were laid in the dead end, in the club, on a dais, where the truncated corridor began, leading over the rails to the new exit. The hooters sounded to end the day shifts. People came from the shower rooms clean and dressed as festively as they could manage. The starters were a bit sparse, but Proshka atoned for everything. They had cooked him superbly. He was served roasted, with the head separate. The head squinted through narrowed eyes. The ears were oily, transparent parchment. The meat was tender, just lightly veined with fat. He had been slaughtered at just the right time. The meat melted in their mouths. They poured mushroom moonshine from the old reserves. The toasts proposed became more and more heartfelt. Welcome back. Good health to you, Artyom. Anechka, and here's to you. And little kitties to you at last. 
And don't take this for bootlicking now to the parents, to you, that is, Alex and Lexique. Piotr Ilyich got worked up and really stood out at this great supper, with his red hair standing up like a crown round his crimson bald spot. And then let's drink straight away to our exhibition station, an island of peace and stability in the raging ocean of the metro. Thanks to the efforts of a certain person, and you know who. Ardyom had thought he wouldn't be able to get a single morsel down, but he'd gotten so hungry that he wolfed down two portions. It was a fine young boar, really, although it was best not to remember that he'd been grunting just this morning. But then they all grunted some time. Were we just supposed to stop eating them? Artyom just couldn't drink. But Sukhoi didn't miss a round. They were each preparing in their own way for the talk with the people. I wanted to talk things over with you. I was waiting for you to show up. Of course, you're free to talk to people. I don't take back my word. But I just want you to understand that you don't have to, you know? The mushrooms and the pigs. You can do something else. Reconnaissance, for instance. Thanks, Uncle Sash. Little Kirill sneaked over the coffer. Boo! He tried to frighten Artyom, then climbed up on his knees. He'd run away from his mother. It was past his bedtime already, and he ought to be sleeping. Then she came herself, Natalia. She scolded her son, but agreed to stay for a while. There was still some of the young boar left. Ah, Anya, give me a piece. Come over to us. I'll put a bit more on your plate. You need it to grow. Kiryuka was given his own plate, and he sat down between Artyom and Anya and started chewing on his meat for dear life. Before the third serving, Artyom's stepfather was approached by a watchman, the Georgian Ubilava, who whispered something to him. Sukhoi wiped his greasy lips and, without looking at Artyom, got up from the table. Artyom watched over his shoulder. Sukhoi had been called to the southern tunnel, the one leading to Alexeyevskaya station, and on into the metro. What was going on there? Artyom couldn't see. Sukhoi walked behind the columns onto the tracks. He didn't come back for ten minutes. And did you find polar dawns? Kiryuka bleated. What? Artyom asked absent-mindedly. Polar dawns! You said you'd picked it up. Did you find it? That's what you went for, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I found it. Ma, do you hear? Artyom found polar dawns. Natalia pursed her lips. That's not true, Kiryushenka. Artyom! It is true, isn't it? Stop it. Natalia told Artyom. What's it like there, Tyom? What's there in Polar Dawns? How are things with the microbes there? Just a moment, said Artyom. Wait a bit, kiddo. Sukhoi was standing with some men at the south end of the platform, looking round at the feast, signaling in semaphore with his crimson face in the crimson light. Artyom wanted to go over to him. He started getting out and moved Kiryuka over, but his stepfather noticed and waved to him. Stay there. I'm coming. What's happening? Anya asked. We'll tell her that it's true. Right. Now you're going off to bed. Sukhoi sang back to the feast. He sat beside Artyom and smiled as if his lips were cracked and it was painful to stretch them out. In his annoyance with his mother, Kiryuka picked at Proshka's screwed-up eye with his fork. Dashka served Ilya Stepanovich a good portion of fatty top leg. Artyom took hold of Sukhoi's elbow. What's happening, Uncle Sash? They came to get you. We gave them their marching orders, of course. The orders men? From Miller? Anya held her knife in her hand as if she was about to strike out with it. Artyom laid his fingers on his pocket. The Nagant was still there, in its place. No, from Hansa. Are there many of them? Did they spend special forces? Two men, civilians. Only two and what? What do they say? They say they'll give us time to think until the morning. They understand that you're my son and all the rest of it. Sukhoi looked down into his plate. They say they don't want to take things to the extreme. Artyom didn't argue about the word son. And what happens in the morning? They'll start a total blockade of the station. They won't buy anything from us anymore, and they won't sell anything to us either. All mash for the pigs and so forth, plus a ban on all travel. They say they've already settled that with Alexievskaya. Andre, the senior scout, stood up. He raised his glass. A toast! Your father and I have already discussed this, Artyom. Comrades, I am a victim of force majeure. I've fallen in love. And my love lives at Krasnopresnitskaya station. I realized it was time. I'm 38. 
So I'm leaving my beloved home station exhibition and moving to join my bride in Hansa. So what do I want to drink to, basically? I want to drink, Artyom, to every one of us finding his own place. And now my place is free for you. Artyom nodded, stood up, clinked glasses, and sat down again. He whispered to Sukhoi, How long can we hold out? I don't know. The mushrooms, well, you can see. For a while on the pork. Only there won't be anything to feed them with. All the feed comes from Hansa. Since when does Hansa deal in animal feed? Where do they get it from? Didn't the plague affect them then? It's combined fodder, I told you. Not made from mushrooms. A mixture of something or other. But the pigs eat it. They don't turn up their snouts and they put on weight well. But haven't the pig farmers asked what it is they're feeding them? Where they get it from? Maybe we could do something like it ourselves. I don't know. We don't ask. Supposedly, Hansa gets it from the Reds, according to the rumors. We tried it. The pigs eat it, so why quibble? We... Where would the Reds get it from? The Reds have... Pyotr Ilich. Where do they bring the all-mash from, do you remember? Why, from Komsomolskaya, I reckon. I recall them saying it's close by. Fresh. Although not so very fresh these last few times. From Komsomolskaya? Salty, bitter spittle flowed into Artyom's mouth. His throat cramped up and he couldn't swallow or get any air down. From Komsomolskaya, from the Reds, from Hansa. What's the difference? But what's wrong with it? You don't ask any unnecessary questions, right? A blockade shit? I have to feed people, Artyom. Two hundred souls. If we have it, that's good. One day when you're a station master, you'll understand. Artyom stood up. Can I? Oh, the star of the occasion. Let's have a toast from you, Artyom. And he pulled himself up to attention, as if he really was going to propose a toast to them. Only his fingers clutched air instead of a glass. Some men just came to get me, supposedly from Hansa. They want to catch me and take me away so that I won't have time to tell you all of this. If you don't hand me over, they say they'll set up a blockade. People at the table started shushing each other. The song that was just starting up about evenings near Moscow faltered and stopped. Some carried on chewing, but without making any noise. Moscow isn't the only city where people survived. Yesterday at Polis, they announced to everyone that there are others. Soon they'll tell you here about that too. So think of me as the first. The whole world is still alive. Petersburg, Ekaterinburg, Vladivostok, America. But we didn't hear about it because they were suppressing radio contact with jammers. The silence was deathly. People listened, transfixed. We don't have to live here any longer. We can pack up and leave at any moment, right now, go anywhere we like. At Murom, only 300 kilometers from Moscow, the radiation level is already normal. People live on the surface. It's Moscow that is dead and poisoned because the warheads were intercepted above it. We shouldn't stay here. We mustn't stay here. What I'm suggesting, what I'm asking you is, let's leave. What for? Someone asked him. Trudge 300 kilometers and then what's there? What are you listening to him for? He's nuts on this subject. What for? Because man's place isn't under the ground. Because you live in tunnels. They keep you in tunnels. Like worms. Do you at least remember about it? These idiotic wars we fight against each other? We have no tomorrow here. This is a graveyard. The metro. We'll never be anyone here. We won't be human here. We won't do anything new. We won't grow. We get sick here. We're degenerating. There's no air. There's no room here. It's cramped in here. There's just enough for us, someone told him. Did Dushanbe survive? Someone inquired timidly. I don't know. So you compare us with worms then? But what if America's still all there? Is the war still going on? Someone at the table asked, thinking out loud. In the city of Murom, there's a monastery, painted all white, and the domes above it are bright blue, the color of the sky. It stands on the bank of a river, surrounded by forest. Why don't we go there? First scouts, and then everyone would go. We'd find some kind of transport and fix it up. Women and children... Metro 2035, Dmitri Glukovsky, Chapter 23. His own people. Here, here you... Damn you. And there's obviously no other way here. That's the whole problem with this place. It isn't a refuge, it's a crypt. We have to clear out of here. So you bloody clear out then, someone told him in a low, sullen voice. Why can't you clear out on your own? Why drag other folks with you, like some bloody Moses? 
And what if Hansa wants us to hand him over for something he's done? Has he killed someone? A woman asked inquisitively. Artyom looked round at Sukhoi. He was running his eyes round the table, as if searching for support for Artyom. But he didn't interfere. Artyom wiped his forehead. All right, okay, I'm getting together an expedition, purely exploratory for now. We'll go to the east and explore. We'll try to find a place there fit for habitation, and when we find it, we'll come back for the others. Who's with me? No one answered. They chewed, gaped, and drank. No one answered. Anya moved her knife aside. She got up. Me, I'm with you. The two of them stood there for a moment. Then everything started buzzing. Consumptive Kiryuka clambered up on the bench so he could be seen. He squeaked determinedly. Me too. I'll go with you. Out of the metro to Polar Dawns. He stood up exactly where he had been sitting, between Anya and Art Young. They glanced at each other. Natalia, his mother, recoiled from the table. Glasses went flying and smashed on the floor. Come here right now. That's it. We're going to bed. Aw, oh, Ma, let's go to Polar Dawns. We're not going anywhere. This is our home. Aw, oh, just let me go and see. No. It's the surface, Natal, said Art Yom. There's air up there, different, fresh, and the tuber. If there's no tuber, there's something else, some kind of plague. People say there are Americans out there. Do you want to hand us over to the Americans? If you don't want to, let him go. Here, he... You told me yourself. How long has he got? You want to take him from me. She started choking. You want to take my son? Ah, you filthy rat. I won't let you have him. I won't allow it. My little Kiryushka, did you hear that? He wants to take my son from me. Give him to the Americans like a toy and go himself and hand us over to them. You fool, Artyom told her. You bitch. You push off up onto your surface, comparing us with worms. I won't let him go. Don't you dare. Don't let them take him. Don't give him the child. He's fucked in the head. Everybody knows that. Where would he drag the kid off to? We won't give him to you. This is way over the top. I want to go with you. Kiryuka started crying. I want to take a look at the surface. Ah, just hand him over to Hansa and that's that, someone said. Let them sort it all out. So you push off. If you're so miserable here with us, push off, you traitor. They started moving back from the table, jumping to their feet. We'll stay here then. Eat. Carry on devouring each other. Let them herd you around like sheep. If you want to croak, then croak. If you want to shuffle through shit, then shuffle. If you want to dig over your lousy fucking past, go on. But what are the children guilty of? Why do you want to bury the children alive? You're the sheep. You've sold out. No one will go anywhere with you. Where do you want to lead us into a trap? How much did they pay you? Just hand him over. Are we supposed to break off relations with Hansa because of this shit? Right, that's enough, Sukhoi shouted, getting up. And you ought to keep an eye on that kid of yours. Now he's gone and sold out to someone or other. Poisoning us all that time wasn't enough for him. Maybe we wouldn't be sick if that bastard hadn't kept opening the seals. You keep your nose out. Don't meddle in our business. We'll manage all right. This is our home. Tio Ohm, I'm with you. I want to go. Please, ease. Push off. Get lost before we hand you over. Why should we suffer for him? Kiryuka's hand found Artyom's index finger and clutched in a tight hug, but Natalia jerked him and dragged him away. Artyom's eyes started running with tears. Dad, he looked round at Sukhoi. Dad, and you, will you? I can't, Artyom, Sukhoi murmured in a dead voice. I can't go with you. How can I abandon the people? Artyom blinked. His head was spinning. What he had guzzled was stuck like a cobblestone in his throat. Ah! Fuck everything in this damned metro with a barge pole! I was ready to croak for all of you, but there's nobody here worth croaking for. He swept the plates of human pork off the table with a crash and a clatter and kicked over the bench. Striding behind him came Anya, and plodding after them for some reason was Ilya Stepanovich. Have you decided to go up on top then? Artyom asked him. No, not me. I'll stay here. I'll write about you. Artyom? About all this? Give me your permission, eh? Will you let me write a book? I'll put everything in it, just like it is. Word of honor. Write the damn shit. You won't get a fucking thing written anyway, and nobody will read it. Homer's right, the old bastard. Everyone wants fairy tales. 
In the west the sunset sky was scarlet, but in the east it rang as crystal clear as a freshly washed bottle. All the clouds had been swept off it, and now, one by one, little silver nails were being hammered into the cerulean vault. They tossed food, cartridges, guns, and filters into the back of the station wagon. There were still three full canisters of diesel oil in there, enough to drive halfway round the earth. The Yaroslavl Highway, massively wide, ran straight from the exhibition of economic achievements to the far edge of the continent. It was crammed with cars and trucks that never reached their destinations, but visible between the vehicles that had got stuck in the past was a narrow furrow through which it was possible to drive in that direction, to somewhere. The dead buildings glowed gold around their edges, and in this moment of farewell, Moscow seemed warm and real to Art Yom. He was sick of the rubber on his skin, and sick of the preparations for the journey. He wanted to ditch the rubber already. He wanted to race along as soon as possible with the windows down, catching the oncoming stream of air with his open hand and breathing it, warm and fresh. But never mind. In about three, maybe four hours, they'd take these gas masks off once and for all and fling them out of the window as far away as possible. They embraced anyway. Where are you going to go? asked Sukhoi. Anywhere at all. Where are we going on? To Vladivostok. I want to go to the ocean. Vladivostok it is, then. Artyom moved Savelli's white animal skin to Anya's seat. They needed to be careful. She still had to have children. He put the Nagant in the glove compartment, started the engine. They slammed the doors. Sukhoi leaned down to him and asked him to lower the window. He droned through his trunk. Artyom, don't judge the people. It's not the people's fault. Artyom blew him a kiss. See you, Uncle Sash. Ciao for now. Sukhoi nodded and moved back. Ilya Stepanovich, huddling up, waved his hand. There wasn't anyone else seeing them off. Artyom put his hand on Anya's knee. She covered his glove with both of hers. The Japanese car sneezed blue fumes, struck up a marching song, and shot off immediately that way to the magical, fabulous city of Vladivostok, standing on a warm, gambling ocean, across an immense and beautiful, unknown country inhabited by real, live people, and a luminous, sunlit fair wind saw them on their way. The end. Afterward. They were good binoculars. German, really high quality. Easily good enough to see for a kilometer, or even farther. The off-roader trailed the Japanese car at a cautious distance as far as the Moscow Orbital Ring Road and halted there. He scrammed, Alexei Felixovich, Lyoka said to the walkie-talkie. Shall we stay on his tail? What's he going to do out there? Let him bugger off. Good riddance, said the walkie-talkie. That's it. Come on back. Recorded by I. Shkirkin.